Shit. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. I'm Tom, and today, once again, joining us, film historian, film writer, film pre pre uh, film preserver, director, writer, everything from under the sun, Mr. C. Courtney Joyner, best known for his work on Trancers 3, Puppet Master 3, Dr. Mordred, the Shotgun series, oh, God, film, countless film commentaries, an overall great guy, Mr. Courtney Joyner, how are you this afternoon? Oh, man, I, I, right now, I'm just, I'm just blushing away. But <laughs> Still get I, recognized for Transfers 3 whenever you show up on Bad for Your Health. Oh, well, that's very nice. Well, we're uh, uh, speaking of Transfers 3, uh, have you, did you see the cover of the latest issue of Delirium? No, actually, I have not. Let's see. Let me show. I think I've got it right very close at hand. Uh, uh, shoot. Oh, wait. Is this it? Oh, got it. I didn't know I was going to do this. That's all right. Our, our offices look the same. I didn't know I was going to bust out my, my Tom Conway picture, but. And anyway, it is a spectacular cover of, uh, it's called, the, the main article is called Scorpio Rising. It's a uh, interview with Andy Robinson and a spectacular cover of him as Scorpio and Dirty Harry with Eastwood in the corner. It's great. Oh, my God. We were just talking about Dirty Harry the other day at work, the timeless classic. And I am looking forward to meeting Mr. Andrew Robinson at this year's Terrificon in, uh, Mo at Mohegan Sun in Uncasville, Connecticut. Oh, there you go. Uh, I you think know, he, he's one of my favorite people. And uh, we've been friends since I was in college. <sighs> Can't wait to meet him. It's a long time coming. Dirty Harry, I saw it at that a tender young age in my life, but... I'm afraid I'll be the one guy that brings up Trancers 3. No, actually, let me tell you something. You actually will not. I was up at Andy's house uh, probably about a month ago or so, and we were in the backyard talking about stuff. And he said, he said, Court, every, every time I go to a convention, somebody brings up Trancers 3. He now has to, like, sometimes he actually has to bring pictures of himself as daddy mother to <laughs> these <laughs> conventions and not you know, for the Star Trek people and, you know, so much going on, Hellraiser and everything. But there you go. It's either going to, I'll have to bring up Transfers 3 because of our connection, but I, I might, I, I might bring up Pumpkinhead 2. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that I'm, was a little less because, because, you know, Jeff and I were friends and uh, Andy's wife, Irene, used to be my agent. And that's how you got hooked up with him to do Death Lives. We, well, I had known him since uh, USC when I did a little uh, Super 8 documentary on Don Siegel. So I met him when I was 19. The face of an and, angel. Yep. And we, we, he let me shoot him, film him in his living room. And we just always kept in touch. And I was writing and showing him stuff and being a pesty little fanboy. And, um, but at the time we were doing Whisper to a Scream, Irene, who had been a very successful agent and manager, decided to go back into it. And uh, I was one of her, uh, well, I was one of the clients she signed. She did my contract for prison. That's awesome. Yep. Beautiful lady, just great. And I love their daughter, Rachel. And yeah, you know, we all, me and Jeff and Darren Scott and all of us all became, you know, part of the, part of the enclave there. Well, I think it's great that he's he he's going to come to a big comic convention. Obviously, you, the Terrificon is becoming one of the biggest ones in the Northeast, I, in my opinion. And now, kind of branching out and doing, you know, Andrew Robinson and Terry Farrell and all like there's so many other Michael Bean, Jonathan Frakes. I'm actually very jealous about your going because the thing is, uh, with that, uh, of course, Don Glute's going. Don and, Glute will be there. Excellent. And um. You know, I'm a bit, I go to Monster Palooza and stuff, but I, it's it's weird. I haven't been to San Diego Comic Con in a very long time, and I'm not by nature claustrophobic, but it just got so huge in the sales floor. Oh. Just, oh, it, huh. it it got a little too much for me. I was like, yeah, you know, this is. Well, court, fly, go to LAX, fly out to Bradley. I'll pick you up. We'll go stay at Mohegan Sun. Spend the night drinking bourbon and water, telling wow. stories. That's like the greatest offer I think I, I've had. It's certainly the greatest offer I've had this week. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Shirley Temples, whatever way you want to float, you know, because I, I kind of retired. You know, well, it, it would be good, Courtney, if you came out to Mohegan Sun. You would love it. Have you ever, You've been, obviously, to New England, but have you ever been oh, sure. there? No. Ooh. It's Vegas of Connecticut. It's hell on earth. <laughs> Man, well, uh, no, I'm uh, Tom. I'm actually going to give this some real head scratching time. I will send you all the links to the wh whatever. Oh, I done. The problem with it is the the hotel rooms got expensive because it's like the day after the convention the last year they go on sale. Obviously, and you can book so far in advance as you know with hotel rooms. So, like the day after, it's like a hundred bucks, and then. Obviously, the price goes up as you get closer. The last time I checked, it was pretty close to five hundred bucks a night. Wow! Now Dunzilla, who you've met, you know, and he's you know, okay. Dunzilla's coming back to Bad for Your Health in a couple of weeks. That's one of the big teases I had at the end of the show. But Dunzilla and I usually try to stay overnight. This year, because of that, we're kind of like, "Oh, mm, you done? I don't know. What do you think?" And he goes, "Done in classic Dun mode." He goes, "Well, what if we just get more people to come with us?" <laughs> and there you know, to buy. Simple division, and I'm like, I'm like, okay, you know, done. That's not a bad idea. So you know what, Courtney? That's not LAX to Bradley, three hour flight, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, let me. Yeah, I'm. I'm definitely uh, check my, uh, you know, my pocketbook and all the other, uh, you know, pertinent items, and uh, you know, I, I, I'd love to do this. There's so many great uh, comic book. Care, you know, comic book writers and artists that are going to be this year, be there this year. I think out of the seven years I've got eight, well, no, minus COVID. So like out of the six or seven years I've gone, I think this is the most stacked lineup ever for oh, actors. Is, say that again. When is, when is it going to be? Late July. Okay. Uh, well, actually, th maybe this will sync up. I am not at liberty to say. <laughs> However, uh, I am going to be uh, uh, filming uh, for a television series, uh, a stack of appearances, uh, and uh, will be in Atlanta in July. Hot Atlanta. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so we'll let's we'll we'll figure it out. We'll get we'll, we'll get something. We're always here. in communication about this stuff. But yes, that Andrew Robinson is one of the highlights for this Terrificon for me. I cannot wait to meet him. I won't pester him about Cobra. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He'll have the yeah, horror people for Hellraiser and things like that. But no, it's going to be a good time. But they have not formally announced Don Glute. I'm sure that will be coming in the next uh, week or so. Oh, I'm sure. Because he had a pretty good line. And I, 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 Don, obviously meeting him through you and meeting him in person last year, he finally got that Invaders 31 sign. But that was incredible. But today's topic at hand court is Val Luton. Ironically, yeah. on his birthday. Ironically, on his birthday. Absolutely. May, born May 7th of 1904. He was a novelist and everything. So how did he get hooked up with David O. Selznick, who then went on to become the producer of the 1939 epic timeless classic, Gone with the Wind, Courtney? Do you know how they hooked up? I don't, you, Well, you know, Luton was a story analyst, and how he made the, you know, entree uh, to, because he first knew um, Selznick. Remember, Selznick was the head of production at RKO. Yes. For years. And everybody forgets that his name is on King Kong and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, Luton was, I believe, just in the story department. He and Selznick kind of clicked. And when Selznick stepped away from RKO to form uh, Selznick International and basically go independent, uh, Val Luton was one of the people that he trusted. And, of course, now uh, notoriously was the one who told him not to make Gone with the Wind. And Selznick listened to other folks and not Val Luton. And there you go. But Luton was such an important cog at RKO that uh, as a producer, unlike, say, uh, say someone like Herman Schlamm, uh, who, who did so many of the series pictures, the Falcon pictures, the Saint pictures and what yep. have you. Yep. Uh, Luton was going to be the, you know, he was kind of the independent to do non-series films. You know, he wasn't going to be doing the Dick Tracy's. He wasn't going to be doing those movies. He was not going to do and, established, like, 
franchise. Right. And the head of the uh, production unit for whom Luton worked was a man named Jack Gross. And he sat down with everybody and said, look, uh, Universal is kicking our ass. With the resurgence of the monster movies. With the Wolfman and then everything that immediately followed during the World War II period. But Courtney, so, didn't some of that go because they re-released Dracula and Frankenstein in the late 30s and it just it, it made astronomical money? Well, the thing was, um, in around 1935, remember, there had been a ban on horror films in England. Yes. And so suddenly, and The Raven actually was one of the movies that was seen as a big culprit because of the sadism and all that yeah. stuff, that sexual overtones. Cool movie, so, though. Oh, I love that movie. Love Raven. I can torture out of myself by torturing you. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, when uh, everything dried up, that was poor Bella Lugosi. It was, uh, he kind of ran out of road. He did a few, uh, you know, he did a few movies, but uh, he had been so, unfortunately so typecast that he was finding it difficult to find work. Was Bella uh, the original OG typecast? I say yes. <laughs> I, or maybe... I say yes too. I don't know what the hell you just said. The original, the the OG, the original. <laughs> uh, what what does that mean? Original gangster. Oh, original gang. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's you <know>. okay. <laughs> OG, Jesus, man. Come the on, OG typecast. <laughs> well, you know, he was always going to be uh, seen as a heavy rather than as a romantic lead because when he broke into movies, he was the continental lover type, and so. You know, he's very handsome and he was tall. And so that was how he was cast. But he became more and more sad, especially after Dracula and Murders in the Rue Morgue and White Zombie and all that stuff. All that, great movies. That he then, you know, again, fell into the... And he... which What, what did he... He did a Saint movie, didn't he? Yes. He did. He did the Saint in Trouble, I think. Yes. It was the one where Sanders was the... It was the twin. It was like he was the bad right. guy in... No, yeah. The Saint the saints double trouble saints double trouble not saints trouble saints double trouble Saints double trouble so but that was where he was and he was kind of spotty and uh, but boris karloff during this period of course did the mr wong series at monogram yeah and he continued with his contract at warner brothers uh but they became more uh even though one of them was banned again uh devil's island which is a very good movie Yes, it is. More uh, just uh, dramas like West of Shanghai and things like that. So then that uh, theater owner in Los Angeles had the idea of just grabbing a print of Dracula and a print of Frankenstein. It's 1938, and it went through the roof. And then so Son so of Frankenstein was immediately greenlit and, you know, right. kind of kicked off volume two. That's of right. The Son of Frankenstein and Black Friday and all that stuff. So all of this had happened. Uh, everybody was jumping into the horror business, and Jack Gross turned to Val Luton and said, okay, we're going to be making horror pictures. Uh, you have to get to work. And Luton's sensibility just was not the universal sensibility. It wasn't, no, but wasn't, wasn't RKO gone through financial hardship because of Citizen always, Kane and the Magnificent Ambersons? They always were. Yeah, it just never stopped. Even when they would have hits, uh, it's uh, the the studio was always you know working on a deficit. That that was the classic World War II joke. If the Japanese attack Los Angeles, go to RKO. They haven't had a hit in decades. <laughs> Even though they would have a big hit in 1942 with uh, yeah. Val Luton's first picture. Yes. Oh, they they weren't quite as desperate as as everyone would like to see, but. You know, the, the financial instability of the company allowed Howard Hughes to buy them and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Uh, but that was where, you know, Luton was kind of handed this hot potato and he despised uh, what Universal was doing and uh, the Wolfman and those movies. Now, here's the here's the interesting thing. Uh, that the Luton's attitude about Universal horror 
was brought up to Kurt Siodmak. Did you ever read that interview? I've heard of it, but I've I've heard of, I, I I know of the story. Okay, Siodmak got kind of hot. He was kind of a grumpy guy anyway, but yeah, he got he got kind of hot because he said, "Wait a minute, you're telling me all of this about Val Luton and that he hated the work we were doing at Universal." And he did. He said Luton was a lot more erudite than the Universal guys. But why would he hire me if he had such little respect for what I was doing? Yeah. Now, of course, Kurt Yodmack had a long history as an author and everything else beyond the creation of the Wolfman. But uh, that's um, it's interesting. So there are kind of some contradictions. Now, as we know, Val Luton was not happy about RKO doing a contract with Boris Karloff. He was against it, but they ended up like having a simpatico relationship because oh, really? Karloff wanted to act. Yes. And not kind of just, oh. Well, he was very unhappy. Uh, he got a lot of money, but he was unhappy with uh, the double whammy from Universal of House of Frankenstein and the Climax. And this, of course, is after the enormous success of Arsenic and Old Lace, which made him very wealthy. Yes. And he suddenly is like, well, wait a minute. I'm right back where I was in 1938 or 37, you know, and I want to I want to get out of here uh, with these kinds of films. And even though they were the, the horror pictures, what he saw in Val Luton was someone who he felt was more sophisticated or at least more in emotional sync with what he wanted to do. I, so I get that vibe. Like, there was a kindred spirit there. Absolutely, but boy, uh, Val Luton was not happy when they when they made that decision. Well, you know, the vibe I got reading a lot about Val Luton was that Val Val Luton was a very loyal director. He, he was so loyal to that crew of Robeson and Jacques Tenet, and I'm assuming some of the other actors he worked with on those pictures. Simone oh, yeah. Simon, I mean, God, he worked with her, what, three times, three or four times? <coughs> well, of course, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. She was, she was. <coughs> she was a very beautiful French actress from the early 30s, and, and she just she showed up. And had a big affair with Philip Jordan. I heard that story. Although the whole key under the, under the boudoir thing, I think, was disproved. Yeah, but still. Still, um, the legends out there. <laughs> but, um, but you know, these were these were the people who were also under contract to the studio. So, Tom Conway and and uh, Dennis O'Keefe and these uh, uh, actresses uh, are uh, oh, our beautiful friend from um, uh, Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. Uh, yeah. Not Lenore Jane Randolph. Yes. So. Uh, Anna they Lee. were contract players. They were contract players. And uh, then, of course, the regulars that you would see in there, like Robert Clark and, you know, what have you. But that leads, you know, also to, to my old my old troublesome buddy, uh, Lawrence Tierney, when he was signed by RKO by Val Luton. And it was like <laughs> the Lauren McCall situation because his wife had seen Larry in uh, – uh, sports uh, catalog. Lauren Bacall. Lauren Bacall situation. It's such yeah, because that's a cool scene in photographs, and that was the same thing. And uh, Larry came on board at RKO, and he did those pictures. for. And he re I used to talk to him about Val Luton all the time. He really liked Val Luton. Well, talk uh, to me about that, some of those stories, if you will. He and Lawrence is in the ghost ship. Absolutely he is. Absolutely. And, which was the second feature that Mark Robeson directed for Luton and his second directorial feature. Well, you know, yeah. there are a couple of things about the ghost ship. And I always love Larry because uh, when we would talk about it, you know, I really like that Skelton Nags. He was a good guy. Who else would <laughs> say that about Skelton Nags? You know, I mean, that's just like classic. <laughs> uh, but one of the things. You know, there were a lot of rumblings about Larry, and this was, you know, he, he stepped away from RKO, and he did Dillinger, and then he came back, and he was, you know, much more of a name, and he had been in a hit film and all that stuff. But Larry always said that Richard Dix, who he said was a very quiet guy, 
uh, was the only one who really sat him down and kind of Dutch uncled him. Ooh. And told him about the trappings of stardom because Dix had been a real movie star and had kind of fallen from his perch a little bit. Dix had a fall from grace in the late 30s. He did. And but he sat with Larry and told him about, you know, the pluses and minuses and what maybe he should do with his money and things like that. And Larry said he was the only one who ever did that to him. Now, it's funny. I told Robert Dix about this, you know, a few years ago before Bob died. And he laughed. He said, that sounds exactly like my dad because he loved to lecture. <laughs> so I always, I always like that. But um, Larry, uh, again, he always thought uh, Luton was, um, uh, had very good taste. And uh, he also thought, you know, Val was the one who started to put once Larry had done Dillinger, they, I mean, I'm, that was kind of the way they always saw him, was uh, usually on the wrong side of the law. So in um, a movie like Youth Runs Wild, he's the gangster who stays at home and exploits, you know, the yeah. tire shortage and all that kind of stuff. But he, um, again, he he liked uh, Val Luton. He, he had some problems with Mark Robeson. Because Robeson, uh, Robeson seems like a very interesting guy. He, like his taste, if just yeah. judging by his filmography. <laughs> well, the filmography is kind of all over the place. Ooh, everywhere. I, I story. Yeah, it's story. Did. But Larry, they were. I forget the the picture. It it might have been Youth Runs Wild, or or maybe even the Ghost Ship. I can't remember. But uh, Mark Robeson uh, told Larry, uh, "Oh, Larry, in this." Next uh, take, give me about uh, 15% more. Larry didn't know what he was talking about. So he does the take and turned to him and said, oh, I'm sorry, I think that was 30%. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, but a couple of years ago, I was at USC for, uh, the, for this was more than probably about 10 years ago at least, uh, for the premiere of that really good documentary they did on John Milius. Yeah, was, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, time that, that, that John had had the stroke, and none of us knew it yet. So we're at USC, and I'm in the theater looking at all the memorabilia and stuff. And uh, Richard Dreyfus is standing there. Of course, he was in Dillinger yep. with Warren Oak, Milius did. And um, I turned to him because uh, there was a lot of material there from Frank Sinatra, including his four Oscars. And uh, he goes, wow, you know, he's kind of marveling at Frank Sinatra. And I said, you made a movie with one of Frank Sinatra's favorite directors. And he looked at me, he goes, who is that? I said, Mark Robeson. And, of course, the movie that Dreyfus is in is Valley of the Dolls. Ooh, and, uh, in the 60s, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so later on at the reception, I heard him tell that story like five times to different people. <laughs> I didn't know this about Lauren. Uh, I, can I call him Larry? Yeah, please do. He, that's I didn't know Larry was. was in a Falcon movie because I had become a huge fan of the Falcon movies. And did yes, not know that he was very, very fond of Tom Conway. Now Conway had the drinking, so did Larry. Uh, so I'm sure they spent a few, but he really liked Tom Conway. And uh, I always suspicioned uh, that the reason that they got to be so close is, of course, Conway. Uh, Larry saw Conway treated pretty horribly by George Sanders. His ass, and, the older, the younger brother of Tom Conway. Yep. And, and not as yeah. good. Tom Conway was better than his brother. It, it, whatever. Tom Conway was better than George. I, I have no qualms saying that. Well, you see, that's the thing. And Larry had his own conflicts with his brother, Scott Brady. So I think that they... That's why they related to each other. Tom but, was uh, better than George. I have no problem saying that. I'll say that in front of any film historian, buff George Sanders fan. Tom was better. And uh, well, you know, it's uh, um, I, I, I really, I love George Sanders for what he could do. That dismissive, you know, area. Oh, yeah, he's good. You know, thing. But uh, and this is horrible, and we'll get all kinds of messages. Sometimes you can actually judge somebody by the people they marry. 
Show me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. Exactly. And George Sanders married Zsa Zsa Gabor. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, there's plenty of reasons to do that, including, you know, <laughs> this was a period when she was gorgeous and had tons of money and stuff, but still, Jesus Christ. Shit. Yeah. Uh, any good Conway stories that Lawrence, that Larry would tell you? Just no, he just was always very sympathetic to Tom Conway and uh, always felt very... He was the guys that he was close to at RKO, and it wasn't it's not a, a lot of actors, but he liked Tom Conway. He liked Ralph Bird very much. I like Ralph Bird. And um, so this was kind of the crew he was he was running with. Uh, he liked Robert Clark. Nothing wrong with Robert Clark. And, and Ralph Bird, I mean, will forever be known, in my opinion, as the best Dick Tracy. I'm sure it, everyone's mind. That's not a knock on Morgan Conway at all. <laughs> well, this was the thing when it was between Ralph was getting ready to go, and it was uh, uh, RKO was tested Larry as Dick Tracy. Really? Yes. And uh, they gave it to Morgan Conway, and he thought Morgan was a was a very good guy, and so uh, no no problems there. But you know they were really building him uh, at that point with pictures like uh, the Devil Thumbs a Ride. And uh, of course, uh, Born to Kill. Oh my! Born God. to Kill is awesome. Yeah, and um, you know he he was really you know at that precipice. But as always, just like Warner Brothers, you know, always would hire sign an actor to threaten another actor. Yeah, they yeah. did that all the time. You know, uh, they you know, threaten Bogart with John Garfield. And then they would threaten John Garfield with Dane Clark. And, you know, so if they ever got tough with negotiations, they would, sw you know, swap we, people out. Yeah. In the old and studio then, days, you could threaten your lead with an, well, we can just make another guy. Exactly. And Larry found himself in that position as being the guy that they threatened Robert Mitchum with all the time. He was the bargaining chip. Yep. I could see Larry as a Dick Tracy. He had that gruff, you know, that he would have been good. He would have been real good. Well, you know, there was a time there when uh, they thought about having him play Mike Hammer, and he would have been great. Oh, my God. Know. He would have been great. What, was this yeah. in the 50s before McGavin? Yeah. Or? No, this was, yeah, right around the time of, uh, uh, I think, the Ralph Meeker picture, Kiss Me Deadly, had been done, but they wanted to do follow-ups. Now, they were lower budgeted. A lower budget fault, yeah. Uh, that's the thing. I mean, you know, Larry instead of Biff McGuire, you, you know, come on. Yeah. He'd but have been a good Mike Hammer. He would have been a great Mike Hammer. Yep. That Interestingly, they also talked to Scott Brady. So, you know, either brother. Yeah. Would have exuded more toughness. Going back to Tom Conway for a moment, though, and I, we're, there's going to be a few Tom Conway episodes coming up on Bad Fear Health because just because I am I've watched all the I love the Falcons, but this is more going back to Cat People. Cat People, I think, is Val Luton's the name the movie he will always be remembered for. What do you think I on think that? So. Um, I would say either that that uh, but well because it, it it the title and everything else and. Uh, it was even, you know, semi-immortalized in um, the remake, the bad, the bad and the beautiful. Yes, <laughs> and uh, that's uh, and in a way, it's a that movie uh, with Kirk Douglas's character, even though he's a ruthless guy, is a tribute to Val Luton. Yes, and uh, but yeah, the Paul Schrader. It's funny the Paul Schrader remake. With you know, Manetto Tool, Naked in the Pool, and all that. Natasha stuff. Kinski, you know, not as crazy oh, yeah. as her father. <laughs> but the thing is, oddly, now it's as if that remake doesn't exist. That's yeah, what, it's like set in its own. So, like I've seen that. Like it's like no one acknowledges that in any of their filmography. I think that's. I mean, it's Paul Schrader being Paul Schrader. You know, I. And Cat I, People I, remakes I like the a movie and I'm, well, of course, you know, Quentin makes the big nod to it in Inglorious Bastards, but yeah. still it's uh it's kind of gone into a vacuum where the Jacques Trenor movie you know remains at the forefront of cinematic consciousness. Yes. You say Cat People they instantly think of the 40 movie, the 1942 picture. Absolutely. I think every everybody does. 
Now, I didn't even me, know it was remade till about ten years ago. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I'm serious. And then I watched it in my you know early twenties, and I was sort of like, oh. <laughs> A good friend of mine had the bust of uh, the full scale bust of Malcolm McDowell in mid transformation. Yeah. <laughs> in his living room. Yeah. You got okay. Dick Smith. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, when you going with Luton, one of the things, too, and, uh, you know, there are certain movies like, say, Mademoiselle Fifi and things like this that yeah. bomb. Yeah. And I think he was rankling just a little bit about the identification with horror, particularly, you know, cat people did great. The body snatcher was a smash. Uh, uh, I walked with a zombie was good, but the seventh victim was not, which is. Yeah. Yeah. And then the straight movies uh, like youth runs wild. Uh, these were, these were kind of, unfortunately they were kind of throwaways. Mademoiselle Fifi was, was a real bomb. That was a bomb. And, um, but he wanted, uh, I think that uh, after after Body Snatcher was so huge, and I, I that that movie is just tremendously good. Body Snatcher with Boris. Yes, it's just it's incredible. I'm sorry, it that is the Val Luton movie, my friend. I'm sorry, it's scorched earth around it. It is so good. It's just. It's just that good. It's that good. Yeah, I I've watched it a few times, and it, it, hey, it's good. There's no such thing as a bad Val Luton horror picture, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, curse the cat people. <laughs> well, you see, that's the thing. He was trying to step oh, into a different direction, so he hires uh, Gunther Frisch. They, uh, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, and uh, it was like, well, is this really what is the audience going to expect? And this kind of wonderful little, you know, uh, story about this girl and her, her imaginary friend and, you know, all of that is not the, you it's know. It's not cat people. It's not cat people. It's not the high point horror, even though you've got uh, uh, the wonderful Elizabeth, uh, oh, gosh. Uh, with and Margaret. Great, no, 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 no. With, with the great uh, eyes, who was in uh, Weird Woman. Oh, um, um, the old woman. No, 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 no. Wait, you're going to have to edit this part out. I have to go look at the title card in my living room. Sure. I'll hold okay. the fort down. Okay, good. We're yes. talking about the, the vast films of Val Luton tonight. And um, it's one of those, he's one of those unique presence in Hollywood history, being the head of the horror division at RKO. Val Luton produced so many great movies. Some of my per my personal favorite was The Seventh Victim, which we discussed last week with Jason Pitts and Marilyn Knapp. And Courtney is a big fan of The Body Snatcher, which starred Boris Karloff, best known for his role in Frankenstein, immortalized in the 1931 Universal picture. But I think that the other Luton horror pictures set a tone for the 1940s that are almost timeless in a way that where... You can go back now and it's almost like a perfect film historian look at this sort of uh, scary nuance of the 40s where you could judge everything sort of in a, in a horror eye, in a dramatic eye, and in a film noir eye. And, you know, film noir was just starting to take off in the 1940s. And I think that that the Val Luton pictures specifically directed by Turner and Robeson really capture the look and the vibe of those, of that look, like I'm trying to say, Courtney's trying to go find his lobby card for curse of the cat people, which was the 1944 follow-up to the 1942 motion picture cat people. And it's, it's, it's a weird movie because it's a different trajectory than cat people. Yes. Is it a sequel? Or is it just a continuation of the characters? And I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but the thing about Curse of the Cat People is it's almost like a standalone sequel where you don't need to see Cat People because there's a few sly references to the, the original movie. The Blu-ray came out great by Shout Factory. I think it was Shout Factory that did it. But I, th I Curse is a weird movie because as Courtney said it, uh, before he we went to get the lobby card, 
Val Luton hated being pigeonholed in the horror genre. But the problem is in that uh, in the years of 42 to 46, I don't think anybody could touch Val Luton in regards to presentation of film. And now with films coming out in 4K, 2K, 8K, whatever they are, Court, you know what I'm talking about. They oh, all, the Luton pictures specifically, look tremendous in black and white. As Courtney and I have talked about several times, it's almost, you know, no one made movies back in the 1940s for home distribution. But now here we are, 80, 70 plus, 80 years on. These movies look better than Robeson and Turner and perhaps Luton could have ever dreamed of. I mean, here we are in 2023 talking about the seventh victim, the body snatcher, Bedlam, and and always the, the timeless Boris Karloff movies. Courtney, since I'm since I'm kind of rambling for a second, like in a like an underpaid college film professor, I did not know there was a there was a connection between Boris Karloff and your mentor Reginald Leborg. I didn't. I, Voodoo oh, Island escaped Voodoo Island, me. You bet. Absolutely. Voodoo Island escaped me, and you know that may not be the greatest movie of all time, but no. Hell, it looks pretty good, as I was saying, in this 4K world that we live in in, in the twenty in the roaring 2020s. Yep, I, yeah, I've always thought Voodoo Island was kind of dull, but you've got kind of the lesbian stuff going on and everything, and uh, it's a weird yeah, movie. Boris yeah, Carlos you got Elijah Cook movie. being Elijah Cook. <laughs> yeah, so then Boris Karloff had a nice time in Hawaii. Okay, the actress I was trying to think of was Elizabeth Russell. Oh yeah, she was in uh, Seventh Victim. She was Mimi the prostitute. Yeah. She was just that incredible feline face. Just absolutely wonderful. And I had to run in and look at my title card to Weird Woman, which is in the, the living room. But I grabbed some things while I was away. Let's see, including, let me see. Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> uh, hold on. Let me get you solo for a second, Courtney. Uh, okay. Boris Karloff in Robert Louis Stevenson's The Body Snatcher. Lower it down a little bit. There we go. And uh, yeah, I have the the one sheet is on the wall in the other room. Fantastic. There we go. Bedlam. Yeah. Now it was a three picture deal that Karloff had with RKO. Right. And and here's the the famous image. There you go. Oh my! I love that I walked with a zombie. I would say the finest zombie movie until Night of the Living Dead, and I—that oh, I mean, I agree. Oh, love totally, it. totally. And you know the thing is, and I—I I did not go to my Western file. You know when when Luton's term at RKO finally ended, uh, and he went to Universal, that's when he did his only color movie. Nineteen fifties. Oh, they... Patsy Grums. Yeah. Directed by Hugo Freegan S, starring Stephen McNally and Colleen Gray. And uh, that movie is really good. And I, I say this unabashedly because I, you know, I wish I'd done a much better job. But that was a huge influence on my doing The Lurking Fear, including getting everybody trapped in a church and the things are outside the stained glass windows and everything. That's Apache drums. That is. I've never the, seen it. I've never seen it. Oh, it's great. I'm going to have to watch it now. It is really good. And, um, it's just so interesting that Luton again, carrying over. All right. We can't afford to have a thousand rampaging Apache warriors. So why don't we just see them in silhouette and shadow through these windows? And we know they're there. You know they're there. Give yep. off that claustrophobic vibe. It's it's terrific. Well, I'm gonna watch it if that was an inspirational lurking fear, because well, I do love I do love lurking fear. Well, you're a very nice guy. But that's uh, you know, but that that's the thing. Even on a universal uh, straight contract Technicolor Western, and they were just churning them out one right after the other during this period. Uh, Val Luton brought his own sensibility, his own touch to that uh, factory, just like he had at RKO. 
it's just a shame that he passed away at such a young age of the, well, I think he was 46 or seven Courtney. And I think had he, it's like McQueen. It's like any other screen legend. If they had lived another 10 years, what else could they have done with their, with that, that creativity? What, what would Val Luton have done going forward into the 1950s? That's like one of those, like what ifs? Well, he was also so uh, literature minded. I imagine that he would have gone on ahead and grabbed some uh, uh, books and translated them. And at Universal at that time, who knows? I mean, Val Luton could have been ended up being the guy who produced Written on the Wind or, you know, Touch of Evil. Who knows what uh, he, he could have done? But he was he was he he was a producer who actually did bring his own touch to what he was doing. And I think that was something he learned from Selznick. David well, he, Selznick used to drive people crazy with the memos and all that type of stuff. But the movies that certain filmmakers made with him, including Alfred Hitchcock, you cannot deny Selznick's impact on the films. Just because your I boss hear, is a little bit of a putz doesn't mean he's in the wrong. <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is the thing. And, you know, he had the, uh, uh, amphetamines thing and uh, yeah. the script meetings at three o'clock in the morning and all that stuff. But still, it was uh, what was created under his unit. Uh, and he and Val Luton were, you know, so intertwined at one point in both of their careers that you can see, I think there were certain now Val Luton didn't have the drug issues, but you can certainly see. <laughs> I, I think the impact that Selznick put into Luton saying, look, you're the producer of this movie. That counts. Your thumbprint should be on the film. It's not just about getting the, the film done on time and on budget. It's, it's doing your movie in a way. Yeah, absolutely. But Luton always did the final script rewrite of every script he, he, every film he worked on. Am I wrong? Yeah. Well, especially cat people through Bedlam. Yeah, as Carlos Keith. Yeah, that was him. Carlos Keith, <laughs> his <Yep>. alias. <laughs> the pseudonym. Yep. Absolutely. God and, bless him. Uh, it's um, and now you know the impact of those films, and kind of the filmmaking style. Certainly, it carried over to Robeson for a movie like. Uh, champion it's certainly carried over uh with robert wise and the setup and things as noir uh you know that approach alfred and hitchcock it, with psycho which definitely came uh you know the post war with, with uh dimitric and crossfired rko yep. uh, then of course uh jacques denor and out of the past uh i mean i'm talking about the the giant you know game-changing uh noirs that were came from that studio. But then, you know, Fox had Kiss of Death with Henry Hathaway and that type of thing. But Val Luton embraced uh, that filmmaking style, the shadows, the blacks, uh, what was hidden. And the boss. later on, what became hidden was a guy with a gun. With Val Luton, it was, who knows? Was it a ghost? Was it a creature? Was it something? Because they didn't have the money no. to show it. That was the beautiful thing with Val Luton. Less was more with Val Luton. Less was more. I don't know if, if we saw a stalking, you know, leopard going after uh, in the cat people. I don't know if that would have worked. The way he was shot and edited, you know, Robeson was an editor, so he knew the tricks. Turner had an eye unlike anybody at that time. It, less was more with Val Luton. Well, that's the thing with, you know, Robeson and Wise, of course, both cut Citizen Kane. Yep. And we're both working on, you know, Magnificent Ambersons. And uh, so, and Robert Wise cut a lot of uh, other films too. He did that. Uh, I rather liked um, that remake of uh, Most Dangerous Game, A Game of Death. Game of Death? Yeah. Game of that's Death. A, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good movie. And, but uh, these guys, you know, when it came down to the actual nut cutting of making the movies, Hey, these movies were done on short schedules. These movies were just like you, if you went over to the valley and there was Lon Chaney dressed as Kyrus, the schedules weren't that much different. No, 
maybe maybe what a five day difference five days yeah yeah and so it's like okay guys you know when it comes down to actually being on the floor what are you getting in the camera are you making your so all of this artistic input and imprint still had to be done for no money and on short schedules on the run and quickly Reading Tom Conway's biography by C.E. Parkinson, I'll tell you, a great little book. Uh, there's a good chapter where they talk about his schedule in 1943, specifically going from, you know, seven, um, what was the second Falcon he did? I think it was Strikes Back. Falcon Strikes Back to the seventh victim, to the Falcon in danger, to the next Falcon picture, then taking a week vacation and then going back to, I, I you know, I walked with a zombie. I, the scheduling for those is just incredible how which sort of became the template for episodic television but they just it was that assembly line of just churning out content and films well you know robert mitchum always referred to himself as rko's mule yeah and uh but that's the thing now he was working on a, obviously a higher you know more important films quote unquote more important <laughs> Uh, bigger, bigger budgets and and bigger schedules, but they put him in one movie after another. It just it, it just didn't stop. He might as well have been making twenty pictures a year because he was always in front of the camera. Yeah, and rightfully so. Mitchum's awesome, but that was that was just the nature of the beast at this time. And uh, and two, uh, one of the things we forget, but you know. Gordon Douglas, zombies on Broadway, and you know all that kind of stuff <laughs> uh, with uh, you know um, Bella. Carney and Brown and B Bela Lugosi. Um, that so much of this product, uh, also the Tim Holt westerns and things like that, this was all made for double features. Yeah. So you were either supporting a bigger movie you know, his kind of woman or God knows what it was, you know, perhaps a musical or else it was going out as a double feature. And the Val Luton pictures, you know, at time, I'm sure this drove him a bit crazy, but were booked into double features with universal horror movies. Oh, that must have killed him. And, but here, here is a thing. And this is interesting as success as successful and in our minds also, because I love the body snatcher so much, you know, House of Frankenstein made more money. Yeah. Yep. That must have drove them nuts, even though it was a both Carl off, both of them had Carl off. Yeah. There was that theater called the Hawaiian Theater that was a horror specialty house. I think it was the Hawaiian. And everybody wanted to get their horror pictures in there, whether it was, you know, PRC's latest George Zuko, Glenn Strange thing, or, you know, whatever it was, Bela Lugosi, one of the monogram nines, Universal RKO. Those were the tops. Because every once in a while, Fox would come out, or Warner Brothers would have a beast with Fox. But usually Universal RKO and, the, and Poverty Row. That's right. Producer Row. <laughs> uh, House of Frankenstein, as I said, was a smash. I have a, a trade ad in there. It says the bad boys have done it again. <laughs> Box office gold. And there's, you know, John Carradine and Cheney and Karloff and everybody. And um, that was uh, so th there really was kind of that that competition. But it but also too, a I mean, man, this would have sent me to the bar, you know, immediately. We are doing this good work. We are, you know this quality work and sometimes you're, we're not striking box office gold. Your backup feature. Yep. Mm. Absolutely. So the recognition now for Robeson and uh, Wise and Jacques Tourneur, the whole thing was, here you go, guys. This was a chance to make movies, which they did beautifully. And then it moved them into another thing. The odd thing with Tourneur, and I think it's because he got, uh, and it's not a denigration, but he started making Westerns in the 50s and kind of stayed there. Yeah. Until, you know, Curse of the Demon and those things later on. Uh, Mark Robeson, after Champion, 
continued and, you know, very good, very, very solid and important movies uh, through the 50s. Unique uh, career. Very good, very good. And of course, now if they even go, who's Mark Ropes? And you can say Earthquake. And then Earthquake. Von <laughs> Ryan's Express. Yeah, I love Von Ryan's Express. Von Ryan's Express is good. And, uh, but, and Robeson did some really wonderful, uh, uh, you know, films about men in combat and war films. But Robert Wise took off like a rocket. Well, as we've talked about, Courtney, Sound of Music and uh, Day the Earth Stood Still. And West Side Story. And, and West Side and Story. And what, what else did Robert Wise do? <laughs> executive Suite and phone call from a stranger and you know just on and on and on uh he he was uh absolutely amazing the haunting I, you know. and i always love the fact that he was very frank about that the haunting was his uh tribute to val luton all great that's a, all those movies are timeless classics i know we were going to talk ghost ship in, in like deep detail but that can wait another time i love this just round robin almost val luton spitback but you were saying the influence of the luton pictures later on with certain directors and things like that how about robeson and perhaps alfred hitchcock with psycho we didn't talk about this last week when uh jason pitts and marilyn knapp joined me for the in-depth seventh victim the shower scene in seventh victim that just screams psycho. That, you know, it's funny because that has now come to light that a lot of people, first of all, the shower scene in Seventh Victim is a little surprising uh, from a censorship. Uh, very risque. <laughs> absolutely very risque. And um, they push the line. They push the boundary lines pretty good. I think, I'm sure, I don't know how many of Val Luton's uh, movies uh, Hitchcock saw. I'm sure he did. They were probably social friends. I uh, certainly Hitchcock was very involved with David Selznick for you know quite a long period. You know, Suspicion and Notorious and the Paradine case and all of that stuff. Uh, but uh, that was after uh, Selznick and Luton separated. Uh, but I don't know. You know, Hitchcock is kind of a little tricky with that stuff. You know, uh, what influenced him? What didn't, and you go to the German Expressionism. There's a wonderful shot at the end of uh, the original Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Great movie. Of Conrad Veidt. Remember, when we find out the whole thing's this bizarre dream. Standing in the room with the other patients with his arms folded, wearing a black turtleneck, leaning against the wall, and is absolutely Norman Bates. There is just no question. Yep. Totally. Totally Norman Bates, the way he's looking. Yep. Yeah, I wouldn't hurt a fly. It is exactly, it's it's incredible. And I put that down more as a tribute, quite honestly, because, of course, Hitchcock was involved with the German movie industry at that time. and uh, So perhaps with the Seventh Victim connection, it, it may, this might be a, a, a retcon? <laughs> well, I think more it was how do you do, uh, you know, uh, moments in a shower with a woman at that time you know you're kind of limited yeah and uh if you wanted to push the envelope of course Saul now Saul Bass was the one who did those boards in conjunction with Hitchcock and of course that became its own controversial thing who actually did what yeah uh, and I'm sure so, now Saul Bass absolutely was a was uh you know I think influenced or you know certainly loved uh the Val Luton films and um uh, so um, it's it's tough to you know kind of determine you know where where all that was because you are talking about still shooting a nude woman in an enclosed space when you could not show nudity technically today it would be How easy you, today oh yeah you know but uh, every Friday the thirteenth or whatever I mean it doesn't yeah. matter uh, but uh, there that was a time when you really had to be clever. And again, that was uh, that seventh victim. That was a real, real surprise. You know, there is a moment also a censorship surprise. Um, Hillary Brooke in the shower in the woman in green. Great movie. 
Remember, there's yeah. uh, Henry Danielle or somebody's calling her on the phone, and there she is behind the glass door. It's like, whoa, Hillary, yeah. So well, I think I'm everybody, ready. yeah, trying to you know step out uh, just a little bit, but of course, with what Hitchcock, what I always found wonderful about Psycho was uh, the original inspiration was uh, American International. And for, for Psycho. For Psycho, yeah. That Hitch saw these films making a lot of money. And as he, and he, apparently the movie, I guess, that uh, his daughter took him to see, I believe, was I Was a Teenage Frankenstein. Great movie. <laughs> which would have been fun, you know, Hitch in his limo there at a drive in, you know, yeah. sitting here because he didn't drive. Um, watching it with his daughter. And the whole thing was, what if we did one of these low budget movies well? Really well. That's how the whole thing started. Yeah. A simple idea. You got That's my thinking for a second. I was a teenage Frankenstein. Gary Conway actually recently answered my question on his uh, Facebook page about I was a teenage Frankenstein. And yeah, he's cool. He's a cool guy. <laughs> he, is a, he is a great guy. And I actually have. A one sheet to how to make a monster, also in the other room, to uh signed by Herman Cohen, Herb Strock, Gary Conway. That was Gary the movie, Conway. How to Make a Monster. I'm sorry, I screwed it was it was how to make a monster. It wasn't I was a teenager, it was how to make a monster. Oh my gosh, how could you you know? Sorry, Courtney. Sorry. Did you uh, did you ever hear the uh the commentary with me and David Delval on the Blu-ray? No, I have not actually. I have the the, the Blu-ray DVD, but I, I have not listened to the commentary. Oh, you should. Uh, David David comes up with his points about the Robert Harris Paul Brinegar relationship, which I agree with a great deal of the time. But also, there are a few times I say, "Oh Jesus Christ, come on!" <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah, that's on there. One one of your commentaries is actually on my uh, birthday list for 2023. It was the one you did right after we met. The thing that could not die. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, that was kind of an interesting situation because Tom Weaver had done the uh, primary commentary on that movie. And so I was recorded separately. But Tom had asked that uh, I kind of submit to him the areas and, and what I was going to speak about. Yeah. So that we wouldn't be repeating each other and everything. So we did that. And I talked about uh, it kind of being a modern ranch Western, which was very much in vogue at that time with, on television, you know, Fury and Sky King and Spin and Marty on the Mickey, Mickey Mouse Club and all that stuff and movies like Man in the Shadow and what have you. So uh, that's what I talked about was the Western aspects of it. I'm shocked you were not asked to do any of the standalone Luton commentaries or or uh, Body Snatcher, Bedlam, Ghost Ship, etc. Well, you know, I'm still in that weird kind of netherworld as far as the horror stuff goes. If I'm with Daniel and we, we do a documentary or something, then, uh, you know, yes, I get to. I'm very pleased, thrilled, actually, to be doing Premature Burial because I love that movie. Uh, with Steve Haberman, that's going to be for Wicked Vision, and um, I've done some stuff for for over like uh, Justin and I, I think did a really nice commentary on the Naked Jungle for Imprint, and of course he's Mr. George George Powell and whatever. Oh yeah, um, but it was a it was a while for me to get a chance to do anything for Hammer, uh, and even though I was very involved with that set, and then. Uh, you know, the inner sanctums, which I did with Regina Laborg. I, we did Calling Dr. Death and also Pete Atkins and I did Strange Confession. But, yeah, they don't they don't think of me for, for those bigger ones, at least not yet. I they hope will. They my phone, I'm still waiting for my call. Whenever you need a good third stringer, you ever do the Falcon's Adventure, call me. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, we're, we're getting there. I've, I've crested over 200 of these things. So. Of know. commentaries? Yeah, commentaries. I count count commentaries and being on camera yakking like a you know magpie. Hey, I loved the her. This, I know we, we're jumping off Val Luton for a second, but I loved the Hercules and the Captive Woman documentary you did for the formerly oh. film detective. I thought that was a fascinating 
documentary about the sword and sandal genre. The one who oh, I don't think you. gets any love from those from that genre before, you know, the spaghetti westerns took over Mark Forrest. No. <laughs> no. And um, love Mark well, Forrest. Well, thank you very much. That's um, you know, that's kind of the the fun thing is when you go into whatever the project is and you're seeing uh, trying to shed light on on certain things and uh, like, even though we're going to be uh, doing a little documentary about the filmmakers uh, because we're doing these sets of uh, this stuff coming out from, uh, uh, you know, from film masters uh, here. And uh, again, the first is, you know, giant hill monster and killer shrews, but with the terror and these other movies. Um, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about in Premature Burial, even though that technically was not the filmmakers. It was a chance when Roger Corman, everybody kind of forgets that he wanted to step away from AIP. Yeah. He wanted to do his and own thing. That's right. And also be more in control of the money. And like with Premature Burial, uh, he made his lab deal and all that stuff with Path A. Did not cast Vincent Price, and I think Ray Milan's wonderful in the movie. But, uh, you know, AIP got wind of it, and they came in, and they bought the movie out from under him. And Sam Arkoff goes, hey, Roger, guess what? You're still at AIP. I think I kind of rankled him a little bit. The terror, <laughs> you, you're going to go in and clean the crap out of that movie, right? Because that's one of those movies you could find at a Dollar Tree, like, 10 years ago, and, oh, you know, absolutely. you get that poor VHS quality. I don't think I've ever seen a good version of the terror. Oh, gosh. The the print we are using is the same one that uh, they used about uh, about five years ago, and it is a stunner. Terror it's is an so, awesome movie. So beautiful. Good. So this is, this is going to be uh, uh, Steve Haberman has so many great insights, and uh, this is really going to be wonderful. And talking about Jack Hill and Francis Coppola and Monty Hellman and uh, all the people who, who contributed to that film. And, uh, you know, this is uh, and Leo Gordon. So this is this is going to be great fun. Do you, is there an estimated release date on that? I don't know. I think that's the next one after uh, Killer Double Shrew. Feet. Yeah. And yeah, uh, double feature. And that, uh, I believe that is, I think that's coming out maybe the first week of July. I saw yesterday Nevada Smith finally got a release date. And I was like, that's the one I've been kind of like, when's this coming out? When's Nevada Smith coming out? And finally I saw it, July 18th. I hope that's confirmed, but that's a day one wow, purchase. No, no, thank you. I didn't know that. We just recorded the commentary uh, a week ago. Nice. See, you guys need me around. The, the, the look for the yeah. unique details. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And uh, that was that was that was terrific. Uh, That's a great movie. That's one of my favorite McQueen movies. I. And, but you know the thing is too, to on the boards and stuff like that. I mean, people can get, get kind of hostile and mean uh, about certain things. And one thing that uh, I don't know who's going to you know. I hope this permeates with folks. You know, those of us who do these commentaries and things like that. We are not the ones who decide what films go to Blu-ray. Not at all. For some reason, there's a big mix-up about that. That's about I get where... that. I get that. You're just a hired guy asked to talk yeah. about the historical aspect of a feature, of a picture. It's not right. like, I'm sure you may have some say, or you may, could make suggestions, but your oh, name's yeah. not on the check to try to make the, the movie. No, I have, and, and I have done that. But there's always this kind of, uh, you know, why, why, why don't they do this? And why don't they do that? Why don't these guys take control? And it's what control? <laughs> you know, control. <laughs> control. The studio control. has de decided uh, to do certain film. And if they call me up and they say, hey, you're, you know, do you want to do the Eagle is Landed? Well, of course. And then I asked Treat Williams to join me. And uh, so that He's was cool, right? Yeah. What? Treat's cool, right? Oh, Treat's fantastic. Absolutely great. 
always wanted to meet him. I all I loved substitute two, three, and four. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, but he's uh, no really great guy. But that's that's the thing, you know, Tom. It it's uh, I don't think uh, folks really understand at times that we're brought in after the fact. The movie is is they've decided on the film. They've it's already been printed, or whatever, and they would like us to make our contribution to the release. Whether I've written a documentary or I'm a camera, or I'm doing a commentary, or whatever. It's what, do you want to do this particular movie? Yeah. My my take on it, Courtney, sort of as an armchair guy watching from the sidelines who may have been on the field at one point, is simply that take the seventh victim, for instance. We'll keep it in the Val Luton realm. Would I like to see seventh victim released on Blu-ray? Absolutely. Do I think it will be released on Blu-ray? Someday. But that's not up to you. That's not up to me. That's up to whoever owns it or wants to ship it out. Yep. It's It's... Who would do the commentary? But would the Blu-ray physical copy make them money? Yes. And if there's no audience, it doesn't matter how great the picture is. If there's no home, on, if there's no shelf life or a home on your shelf, they won't do it. And it, there's sometimes it is this rather slow coming around the corner. Um, like I was thrilled to be asked to do Nevada Smith. Uh, oh hell yeah. And, a, it's Henry Hathaway, and B, it's Steve McQueen. And I had not yet done a Steve McQueen movie. Uh, but when I think of I was, we were thinking about it, this is a one of Steve McQueen's big movies between The Great Escape and Bullet. Yep, and, this was the one. This was the one. And it hadn't come, it hadn't come out yet. No, that, why? that was never on I don't that was on a DVD. I think that came out in the same time the Hunter came out on DVD, which correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Hunter's due for Blu-ray by Kino 2 in 2023. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I mean from the historical sense, the Hunter is obviously his last movie. That's the last sort of Right. The Hunter's not bad. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, it's fine. It's fine. I like it. I own it. I'll buy the but, Blu-ray. <laughs> you know, but that's that's the thing too. I think that when you get, you get, we get into this and the film preservation and all the rest of it, and um, I'm I I forget who it was, but somebody was pretty sulfurous once on the classic horror film boards, and I basically wanted to say, look, asshole, if you want that movie, go pay for it, buy the negative, do the restoration, and release it yourself. Yeah, I forget who it was. It was somebody kind of prominent. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But uh yeah, it, it it's a uh you know, it's a restrictive uh situation and we get and you know, a, you want to do the films that you have a feeling for and that you're enthusiastic for and with me that covers a lot of ground. I mean, I'd love to do a musical sometime. Um, really sure but um this uh I, again they kind of are chasing the wrong people out of town for what they see as a slight against you know whatever their favorite film is uh you know why didn't why didn't you do you know this that or the other and instead of this and um one one release uh, that I was involved with this past year, uh, and this, th if they would do Val Luton in this way, it would be absolutely incredible. It was for Indicator. It was the Western Death of a Gunfighter. Okay. With Richard Widmark. It, uh, Don Siegel had directed it under a pseudonym with uh, Robert Totten. Absolutely incredible release. The restoration a documentary a usc student film starring richard widmark uh just a, a booklet all of this stuff and i've written those booklets as well it's just the royal it, treatment abs it really was the royal treatment from indicate just incredible and this was on a film that forget about uh you know people may know it or not know it this movie is practically anonymous you know, directed by Alan Smithy, starring Richard Widmark at a time when his star was kind of falling. Who 
who is paying attention to this movie, this universal Western? These guys. Well, indicator. And it was spectacular what they did. Speaking of uh, films being discovered and things like that, are you aware that VCI Entertainment found all those serials at USC or in the basement and all that? It was Green Hornet, which just came out. The Gordon yeah, all, Jones all ones. That, all that universal stuff, absolutely. They found and that. In, in fact... Here we go. There we go. And if you want to see our, uh, our conversation on movie serials, just look on Facebook and YouTube on our lengthy conversations about the movie serials, which was one of my favorite episodes we've ever done, Court. And here... I'll kind of try and do this for you. Uh, what do we, we got it? I got to see where I am. Chapter two. Chapter two. Overland Mail with Lon Chaney. Ah. There's Riders of Death Valley. And there's also a great. There, there's Lon. Oh. There it is. Yep. Tied to the stake. And these, all of these uh, universal things, which, by the way, also includes, and VCI did a beautiful version of it. And uh, of course, is it like three brothers that run that? I saw a post where it was like these three guys. They were all just kind of sitting there. They all looked alike. I'm not bad mouthing VCI at all. I think they they've done tremendous work, but like, it seems like a tight knit family. It is, and I've done a few things for them. There you go. Oh, Phantom Creeps is awesome. So, yeah. Uh, I believe that's the next release they're, they're HD and after the Green Hornet 1940. Yes, I think you're right. I inquired and, about the Green Hornet Strikes again. <laughs> well, this is the thing. All the, the Universal... Uh, uh serials you remember there was a nostalgia merchant and there were different outfits and you know a little thing here a little thing there but um if there was ever a focus on serials as we know including nostalgia Mer it was republic yes so and because there was just so much material and smartly a lot of the republic stuff even though they had been re-edited into those features that they released to tv in the 60s um, the the serials remain because they were able to resell them to television. Universal didn't do that very often. No, but they, they, now, they found them in the basement. I mean, come on. It. And they did it with the Flash Gordons. They gave it the right treatment. Yeah, remember they, they re-edited uh, a couple of Flash Gordon serials into uh, mini features. Yes, and sold them Budget title seven ninety nine at Walmart. Yep. It'll be nice to see some of those serials see the light of day because you know the Serial Squadron, uh, the gentleman who runs that. I, I always forget his name. He posted a very not cryptic, but a very sad post about the future of film serials. He, he's afraid he's going to see it go dead. R.I.P. And a few people reassured him that it won't. And he said, you know, oh, I, I, they won't, they'll only care about, you know, Batman and Superman and Shazam, Captain Marvel. And I was like, no, man, it, it's always going to have its title. Okay, wait, wait a second. Hold on. I only have to like step out for about two seconds. Sure. Uh, Courtney's go obviously going to get another film, a piece of film memorabilia. But I think that uh, this conversation tonight has been one of my favorite. Oh, crap. Wrong solo way out. We, we, we sure box the compass. Here, oh, here the, you go. The compass has been. Ah, uh, yes, you should. I think you may have showed me that. Hold on, go solo. Show that again, Court. Show the show that again. We have got Adventures of Batman, Chapter Three: The Living Corpse, yep. mightiest hero of all the serials. My one of my favorite movie serials, I might add, The Mysterious Doctor Satan. That's incredible. Yay. My friend Steve Latshaw has the 400-foot uh, Super 8 version of, of uh, Dr. Satan in the large box. That, that is so incredibly rare to find that. But they did uh, 
the Black Widow. I have uh, Captain Mephisto and the Transformation Machine. These were all the ones that Ken Films brought out on uh, on eight millimeter. And I only have one or two of the uh, of the Batmans. Uh, I've got my my Batman serial lobby card from number one is around the corner, but it's kind of affixed to the wall. God but, bless Lewis Wilson. Oh, baby. You know what was shocking? You know, I know Val Luton now back to the movie serials, but I, when we did the movie serial episode about six, seven, or eight weeks ago, it, w- it was hard to find anything about him. I was like, say, take Keaton, for instance, you know, when Batmania exploded in 89. Adam West did interviews talking about the history of Batman and his personal history, which, you know, almost went 25 years. I couldn't find diddly poo on Lewis Wilson. I mean, yeah. I you'd think he'd have some sort of a public eye because his son became the producer of one of the biggest franchise, you know, the history of cinema. But hey, I I I went digging. I went digging. I couldn't find anything. I know it's <laughs> again. How how does somebody who played uh, uh, Batman become anonymous? Go ask Lewis Wilson. He pulled it off. Yeah, yeah exactly. And Lori, if- Bob Laurie died young, right? Bob Laurie? Yeah. yeah. Well, fairly. You know, Lowry liked to drink it pretty good. And uh, when you see him in those last few films, I guess what? Uh, I want to say either The Corpse Grinders or The Undertaker and His Pals. Yeah. I can't He's remember. Which puffy. One. Yeah. A little puppy in the Harry, face. Had gone gray and everything. He had a very interesting quote once where he says, well, I was under contract, and if they'd asked me to dump a bowl of shit on my head, I would have. <laughs> Bob Laurie said that? Yep. So he was a company man. <laughs> he was a company man, you bet. Uh, uh, I don't think he was the best Batman, though. No. No. But I, I, I like I like him in a lot of movies though, and uh, uh, I really I always really liked him in House of Horrors. I love him in The Mummy's Ghost. Yep, but because you said it best, kind of, uh, he had kind of an aggressive manner in The Mummy's Ghost. He, he just well, Mummy's Ghost. He's kind of a mamby pamby, but in uh, no, the God of Mummy's Ghost is Barton McLean. Yes. Yes, but you said it best. I, you said this about the mummy's this. ghost. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, first, let me try to do this for you. First what did I do? Woman, now it's a reincarnated woman. Sounds like a bunch of applesauce to me. <laughs> awesome. One of my favorite lines you've ever said, Courtney, in, our, in the time I've known you. There's always time for the mummy's ghost. <laughs> there you go. That is that that is the quote one of your quotes that I will always remember and that I will always take with me for the rest of my life. It's always well, time for the mummy's ghost. Well, you know, the thing is so when we talk about all of these films from this era and the the uh sometimes the commitment uh was there and sometimes it wasn't. Uh because it's just like um I had a good good friend who was trying to do a real examination of of Hammer films. And um, he was, I don't want to say he was disappointed, but he was surprised when he would talk to, you know, Hammer personnel and, you know, Jimmy Sangster, Anthony Hines, whoever it was. And I found this also to be true with when I would talk to the B guys. Of course, Tom Weaver is the king of, you know, hunting these people down. How the hell does he do it? (laughs) I don't know. It's really remarkable. But the point, the point is, even for Val Luton, whoever it is, these were jobs. They took jobs to create product. That's what this was all about. Whatever they brought personally to that task and what they accomplished, that's kind of a whole nother thing. But the that that's all this was. This was work. It was work. It was a job. It was a job. And because we get all excited about, oh, my God, you know, it must have been such a thrill to work with. Yeah, uh, that, is that, is that's a thing. Like, whatever you bring to a project and someone's moved by it, 
is it weird to hear people moved by it? Like there's a, an appreciation because most people are good in my opinion, but like when you, you know, if, if someone went up to George Sanders and said, I loved you in, you know, the saints double trouble or Bella Lugosi said that to Bella Lugosi, if you said that to Bob Laurie for the mummy's ghost or, or whatever, or Val Luton specifically, does it take you back a little bit? What do you think about that? I mean, you've had people come up to you and say they love your work. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, yes, people, that, you know, very sweet. Like and, me. <laughs> no, of course it's all, yes, but it's always, you know, that, that's always very, very flattering. And when I've engaged uh, people who've been involved with movies I loved and everything else, they're always, without exception, except one or two I actually made movies with who were jerks, including one of the Baldwin brothers, but I'll tell you that story later. You've told me that uh, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. Uh, Dick. But, the thing is, um, I think, too, uh, particularly with people from a certain era, there's this uh, sense of appreciation because so much of the work that they did during that time was not appreciated. You're right. It was anonymous. It almost seems like at the beginning of the 21st century, everything got appreciated. Yes. And... Uh, because, you know, good Lord, when I would go see Reggie LeBorg in his apartment or, you know, you meet somebody at uh, some kind of a signing or something and I whip out some something. And something. so many times people just go, oh, my God, where did you find this? Yeah. And they get as excited about looking at, oh, geez, look at that and look at so and so and so and so. And um I'm always very, I, I love that. I, I love that reaction. I love it when it's, you know, uh, because it's real and th th it's so unexpected. Genuine. Uh, for them. Yeah. And genuinely uh, appreciative. Um, but at the same time, we are talking about one of the reasons they are surprised is that so many of the movies, and certainly the ones that we love, whether it's old westerns or old film noir or whatever it is, um, a lot of that work has been forgotten. And we're and just trying I, to keep it going, you guys specifically. I'm just the guy watching and, you know. No, no, but, but, you know, too, when you start, we'd start and you go, oh, my gosh, wasn't it great working on the uh, script to, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever it was, you know, the black sleep or something. And they're like, well, uh, I remember that because um, I had to pay the tuition on my daughter's private school. I had to pay for my child's de dental bill. Yeah, the braces. That's it. That's what that's what this was all about. Yeah. Um, I remember Marv Wolfman once I I sat in on a really cool talk. He gave at a convention and there weren't very many people there. Um, because he was just wanted to make the point that, you know, oh, here we are and the, what everybody refers to as the golden age of comics and working with, you know, Jack Kirby and all these great guys. We were churning out these stories, churning out these, uh, uh, pages because we were getting paid to do it. it the job. It was the job. And we all had families and we had mortgages and we had all of that stuff. And that's, uh. You know, that was the motivation behind so much of what we still love uh, from this era. But uh, and what the success or the artistic imprint of, say, Val Luton or Kurt Siodmak or Lon Chaney Jr. or whoever you want to mention, uh, that was literally up to, almost, I think, almost up to the individuals. Yeah. So look at this when we talk about Val Luton. Jack Gross probably did not give one infinitesimal damn about what Val Luton wanted to contribute to those movies and the way he wanted to get them made as long as they got made. And they made money. Yep. That's Courtney, it. you're aware of the story of the seventh victim that was supposedly going to be an A picture and he decided to go B because he wanted to stay loyal to ropes and right? You know that story. Yes. That's one of those great what if, you know, he had gone A. In in the Conway biography that I mentioned earlier, would that have catapulted Conway to a status? But who knows? But here we are, eighty years later, appreciating 
that movie, that those all those works. And as you just said with the comic books, work. That's all it was. Work. Yep. And, and people still appreciate it. Absolutely. You know, or else we wouldn't have been here on a Sunday. Here's I don't like doing this, but I'm gonna do it. Hold on. I don't want to get too personal. You see it, Courtney, in the background there. Oh, good lord. You see it next to Charlie. Yes, I do. Yep. Always appreciated. Uh, well, yes, time waits for no man. That poster is actually right there. You've got <laughs> it in your office, too? Yeah, it's right there. Thomerson holding that pistol. Love that. Love that. I love that. Yeah, you're right. Here we are on a Sunday talking about the old movies. I love... You know, I one of the one people one person I had on recently for the first time, they're like, What's your what's your show like? And I said I pantsing myself off as the absolute poorest Robert Osborne. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. You know. Tom, it's you know, the the thing is when I when we go ahead and even looking at the amazing plethora of podcasts and all that stuff, what we're doing right now wouldn't exist if other people didn't, you know, dig it. If they didn't want to find out about these movies. Nope. I've got a small cult following. I admit that I'm nowhere near what the numbers of other of monster party or whatnot horror syndicate, but no, I'll just plug away. I have no problem being channel. Uh, oh, what's a good analogy and make it relatable. I have no problem being channel 664 on a one 2000 the channel spectrum everything somebody's watching right. the channel hey, and i'll hey, i'll so do it as long as i can growing up in philadelphia uh and of course we had dr shock but we also had channel 48 Science and channel 40 what what was 48 so channel 48 uh they had bought the united artists horror package so that's where i saw the return of dracula about a dozen times but i love <laughs> it God bless it. Speaking of old prints and, and finding old movies, you had made a, uh, a line earlier, buy the negative and, and remaster it yourself, which I'm sure, is, I know there's a guy in England right now, and I don't know his name, he runs the Spider-Man 1977 Facebook group, the Charles mm -hmm. Fry's Productions with Nick Hammond and, uh, you know what I'm talking about, the Spider-Man yeah, TV yeah. series. Yeah. He's doing yeah. that to the 77 pilot. He's remastering it. Well, that's great. I mean, that that shows real commitment because doing that stuff ain't cheap. And I don't know if he's going to run into any legal issues because of the spite. There's this like weirdness of Spider-Man, like who owns the TV rights? Where does Disney and Sony fall into it? Well, there's also, you know, with, with Spider-Man, there is also the issue of, uh, and this goes to that, the whole thing with um, the Charles Fry's uh, estate or freeze. How do you say his last freeze? name? Yeah, because, uh, they re-edited the episodes of the TV show into those features. Yep. And for VHS, they were released like that too in the nineties. Absolutely. So yeah, maybe late eighties. Might have been ninety. Yeah, there's all kinds of weird problems, and that's why you know if a studio tackles a project like that or whatever it is, you know they have the resources to make it happen. And they could hit him with a cease order faster than anything. Unfortunately, yes. Will they, though? That's the question. I mean, like, really, who really cares about the Nicholas Hammond Spider-Man? I'm not saying that as devil's advocate. I thought some of those were pretty neat. Well, that's, I mean, you're asking the eternal question because uh, the interest in those, in that, that project, in those films, uh, seems kind of so insular, you know? Yes. And that's, uh, uh, so this guy's doing, you know, uh, pretty specialized work to uh, make that happen. But but the other part of that observation I just made was somebody's got, I think it's a 16 millimeter or I don't, I have to, I think I sent you the link a month ago and it's still there. Someone's got the Falcon in Hollywood or Falcon out West. It's one of the, it's one of the Conways and they're selling it for like 200 bucks. And I'm like, 
wow <laughs> weird in 16 yeah the um the falcon move all that rko stuff uh back when i was collecting 16 used to pop up pretty regularly that was Unreal. usually 150 or 200 dollars yeah because those are all the tv prints yeah it's not the actual negative it's not the big ass reel no it's just the little uh, put it up against the wall yeah it's a 16 millimeter yeah you were curious about this earlier. I'll just show it again because we showed it in the pregame. Two of the Val Luton characters right there in Conway and Erford Gage, who tragically passed away in 1945 in the Philippines. I love yeah. his character. I love he, he had a good presence about him, but he died fighting for our country in the war. Well, you know, when we were talking about uh, Curse of the Cat People, there was a wonderful uh, interview in... Um, in Tim Lucas's magazine, uh, with uh, oh, who was the the young actress from Curse and, of um, the, in Cat, Curse of the Cat People? Yeah, and Margaret. No, 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 no. The the little girl. Oh, 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 um, um, oh. Real quick Google search on my. I'll edit this. If not, you know. You brought so up she Anne Margaret a couple of times today. I don't think we've even talked about an Anne Margaret movie, have we? Anne Carter. Anne Carter, yes. I okay. messed up. Sorry. <laughs> it was a wonderful interview with her. Lambert Hillier. <laughs> Anne, Anne Carter uh, played uh, Humphrey Bogart's daughter in The Two Mrs. Carrolls. Yes. And uh, she talked about, she didn't find Barbara Stanwyck particularly warm, but, you know, she was fine. But she liked Bogart because I guess one day he sat down next to her and he lights a cigarette. He goes, so what do you think of this deal? <laughs> she was so taken aback because it was like he was talking to Peter Lorre or something. You know, the fact that the kid didn't, <laughs> yeah, didn't phase him a bit. Bogey. So she got, yeah, she got a great kick out of that. I wish that you know movie was better, but yeah. Stanwick, I, I mixed even you could just tell in screen performances, and I hear stories, just sort of mixed aura, mixed energy vibe, seemed all right to those total, you know, drag to other people. She was, I know when when Virgil Vogel was, uh, he directed I think more episodes of The Big Valley than anyone, and I think got so. very close, very close to Barbara Stanwyck. And uh, he loved her, and they had a great simpatico because, boy, now she was she was the star of the show, but she was ready to do anything, jump on a horse, leap a fence. It didn't matter. She was game, first on the set, last to leave. I mean, that real old school pro stuff. And. Uh, he said that's what made working on that show so much such a joy because you know very often the leads of TV shows usually set the tone for the set, and she set the tone for that she with her hard work and dedication. You came in and you were, you know, you were ready to go. I have some wonderful VHS footage of Virgil showing Bruce Dern how to punch her. Really? Yep. I'd like it to see be, that one day, Court. That that would definitely be a and, kick. Yeah, it's that episode. It was from a uh, stockholders meeting, I guess, at ABC, and they did this behind the scenes thing. And it's from that great episode where she and Lee Majors get trapped under the wagon in the mud. Yeah. Bruce, Bruce Stern's the escaped convict who finds him. That's awesome. And, yeah. Just, yeah, wonderful stuff. But, uh, but, yeah, I think Ann Carter just felt that you know, Barbara Stanwyck was a little removed. And, yeah, you know, she probably, you know, some people just aren't that comfortable with children. Yeah. You know? But then there was the absolute opposite that there was Boga. He just talked to her like he was talking to, you know, one of his drinking buddies. What do you think of this? Yeah. <laughs> that is pretty cool. What else you got coming up, Courtney, that you can formally tease here on the live interwebs? Well, I can formally announce it well thank you for telling me about nevada smith i had not seen that yet let me and confirm that on this i think it was blu-ray.com had it i saw july 18th 
which makes sense. And right around my father's birthday, I might add. So oh, that's going to be perfect. Because that's I watched the movie with my father. I always think of Nevada Smith when I. It it it, it was a, it's a movie that holds a, a little spot in my heart in well, nostalgia. I, I, would, I think we did a really good commentary on it and touched on all these bases. A real super appreciation for Suzanne Plachette and. Janet Margolin is wonderful in that movie and just so beautiful. And uh, uh, it's, uh, and there's Steve, but oh man, and really going into the whole thing with Hathaway and how he directed it and Lucian Ballard. And oh yeah, I'm real, real pleased with what we did on that one. It says, um, Kino Larva, July 18th, 2023. There we go. And it looks like it's got the original poster for the slipcover. That's what they did also for Will Penny, which we, we recorded a couple of weeks ago. McQueen's my age trying to be an 18-year-old. I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah, we have, to, we have to touch on that a little bit, too, you know. Yeah, uh, it's fine. It's all good. Movie Magic 101. You know, it's fine. But we have uh, Nevada Smith coming out. Uh, the Audie Murphy movie, Kansas Raiders, uh, Will Penny, that's all from Kino. And then from the newly Christian, Christian, <laughs> Christen, Christian, Master, uh, the double feature of the giant Gila monster and the killer shrews with uh, commentary by the monster party and a documentary uh, written by yours truly and narrated by Larry Blameyer. So because these guys bought Film Detective, though, if this is touchy, just tell me not to talk. Just be like, no, did they got, they got the Film Detective library or do these guys keep what they had? Or are they starting afresh again? You know, I actually, I don't know because so much of what Film Detective had was connected with Wade Williams. Wade Williams died. Uh, so I'm not quite sure where all of this, you know, intersected. Gray area. Yeah. But, uh, boy, they, they went and put those two prints in the soup, and uh, I don't think they would ever look better than they do here. No, but Killer Shrews is one of those weird ones that's in public domain, is it not? Almost all the film detective stuff was public domain. Valid. Hercules and the Captive Woman was good, though. I love that. was awesome. Yeah, Giant Gila Monster's public domain. Yeah. It was nice to see a Reg Park Hercules movie come out in a nice Great-looking Blu-ray. There you go. And Reg Park, obviously, legend, you know, actor, bodybuilder, wrestler, you know, from the and, Stu Hart days, you know. And smart guy. Good businessman. Good businessman, exactly. Good businessman. One of these days, I hope to see a Mark Forrest movie get love, because I feel like, because I heard a story about him, because, uh, um, what was he? Uh, one. Of, I mean, he did what, like seven of those movies. It, one of them, I heard in the late eighties, early nineties, he basically had to go to fans to try to find copies of his films, and I, I found that rather sad. I don't mean to say it with a smile on my face, but he ended up getting copies of his movies. I just found that sad and kind of like, oh sh sh shit, he had to wait that long to see his work. Well. Well, my friend, just be patient because a Mark Forrest film will be zooming right towards you sooner rather than later. Good. Good. Hope it's Mole People versus Son of Hercules because that, <laughs> that one's just funny. All those guys just, you know. De uh, oh, sir, Hercules versus the, the Mole Men? No. Uh, no. The Mole. No, the Moon Men. No, there's a mole people. There's a mole people versus son of Hercules. I think. And gosh, I'm. Well, I love you. Well, I'm a Gordon Scotter, so you know. Goliath versus the vampires is is mine. And Goliath versus the vampires is awesome. Yeah. I do know mole people. Moon men. Yes, Moon. Mole Men against the Son of Hercules. There we go. <laughs> Can never escape Mole People, Mole Men. It's never going to escape me. Well, Tom, let's what? do let's do this because with with all the the horror, 
on the horizon uh, uh, coming out. Then we'll let's do a, a, a whole thing, and we can just uh, I can talk about all. I mean, these like next six releases. I'm I in. gotta wait till the first one comes out. I'm in. I'm in for everything. I'm gonna put Nevada Smith though on the on the Bad for Your Health page and try to get a little bit of traction. A lot, some traction for that. Now, obviously, you don't need my help getting traction for a McQueen Wait, picture. Are you kidding? I'm take anything I can get. I'll help you on the on. Uh, I'm buying it. I'm buying that day one. I wish it's not available for pre order yet. What's the best place to pre order them though, Courtney? Do we help Amazon or do you want to like help their actual site? How do you want to go about you know, this? Only- it seems to me, honestly, that, uh, you know, Amazon, uh, I mean, I pre-ordered stuff from either Kino and Amazon. It always seems like the price is pretty much the same. Pretty much. It, it, it's it's similar. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I have Prime, so I'll usually drift towards uh, Amazon. I'm, I always hope these guys will, you know, and Kino's pretty good about sending copies of stuff and everything. You know, they're nice guys. They seem like it. And... Yeah. It's it, it, Blu-ray.com is like sort of like I checked in almost every lunch break uh, when, I'm, when I'm doing my. <laughs> well, well I'm, like, I'm glad to be able to contribute because the uh, they put up the thing about uh, Gila Monster and Killer Shrews. Uh, I think yesterday. Yeah, you shared it. I liked it. I'm gonna start sharing some of those, but it's just. It's good to see some of these movies seeing the light of day and the appreciation and the preservation of these are just. It's never gonna go away. It'll oh, never no. go away. I, no, no. If if, if if in some odd way I can help take the reins, I'll take the reins any way I can. So, well, you you you're you're top shelf. Oh please, Courtney, you're too kind to me on that one. I look, I know, I know my limitations. I have said that man's got to know his limitations, and I know them. <laughs> On, I'm not I, I, fireball, I, but I'm sure as hell not top shelf. <laughs> nah, come on. Come on, you just quoted John Milius. What did, you know. Glad so you that's... picked that up. I'm glad you well, kind of hard not to miss a, a great Clint Eastwood How Holbrook quote. <laughs> that's it. Hey, what's going on with Clint uh, in postscript here, epilogue? Where I read a rep- no one knows what's up with him. He hasn't been seen in over a year. He's directing a new movie right now. That's what I heard. There was a Google thing, I you know, and it just said Clint Eastwood not seen in 454 days. And I'm like, I thought he was doing juror number two or whatever it was called. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Fake news. Yeah. I don't know. I've seen a lot of photos of him sipping wine at the golf course and stuff. And, you know, just my favorite is him pumping gas. (laughs) Yeah. And oh, have you seen the YouTube videos of him visiting Sideshow? No. Oh my God. Oh. Go to that. Because have you seen the figures? I've seen the figures, yeah. To see Clint going over there and looking at this stuff and that giant deluxe dirty hairy that's like almost seven hundred dollars oh my god that thing is astonishing it's in my save that i'll watch it later on it's uh yeah th- that 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 figure is incredible and i like the man with no name the 12 inch dirty hairy is nice and the man with no name is good and uh they are all they all look great the pale rider looks good but um, I know they're going to do Unforgiven, and that's that's the one I want to grab. Oh, Unforgiven. Him and Hackman, Morgan. I love Unforgiven. I think I saw it at too young of an age, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. How old are you? I'll be 36 this month. Oh, my God. I'm 30 years older than you are. Yeah, shit happens, Court. No, May of, May of 87 <laughs> I was born. That's that was that my birthday is coming up in less than three weeks and oh that's right our birthdays are like a day apart or something something like that I'm the I'm the twenty fifth you're June twenty fifth May twenty fifth no that's right no we're a month apart because I'm we're June a month 25th. apart yeah uh got a four day weekend that weekend and I have no idea what we're gonna do we might go to Salem Mass might just take a ride 
who the hell knows? A good car ride between me and Chelsea. You've seen some of our pictures on Facebook. Oh yeah, no, they were terrific. Uh, let me tell. I'll t I'll the last few episodes, Courtney. I've peeled a lot back into like what it's like being me getting ready for this. There's like so many layers to the the of bad for your health that I've revealed about myself. Not to take up a lot of your time. A good car ride usually consists of me talking, her talking, you know, shooting the breeze back and forth, whatever song's on. But then once in a while, the radio turns off or the seat, what something turns off, and I'll be like, kind of like, you know, Tom Conway was a really good actor. I really loved watching those movies with you. They meant a lot to me. I appreciate that, those times. And then, you know, she'll say something like, you know, I love watching the mole people with you. As a matter of fact, and I'll show it to you next time we talk. She got me this mantle where I can put my wallet and my keys and my watch and whatever. And it says, I'll watch old movies with you for the rest of my life. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Damn straight. I was like, oh, well, I think I'm going to end up marrying her. And we are. Yeah. Courtney, yeah, I, I, she actually asked me this. I'll say this live. Chelsea said, do you want to invite Courtney to your wedding? And I'm like, he lives in California. I would hardly ask anyone to go. I, I I hardly ask some people from Connecticut to come. I would not ask Courtney to hop on an airplane to go to LAX to Logan, rent a car, and come out to wherever or was. <laughs> oh, I'll uh, I'll send a wedding present though. That uh, cool. That'd be cool. That'd be <laughs> delightful. Anything would be appreciated. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll we'll figure out something. Uh. Yes, and you we we had mentioned Dirty Harry a little while ago about Clint. Uh, sometime later this year, we're actually going to do a 50th anniversary of Magnum Force. If that's something you want in, uh oh, there you go. Because I think Magnum Force is the most underrated. It is, but you know, Magnum Force has unfortunately so many built-in structural problems. And yeah, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. It's, it's it's an odd mix of things. And uh, listen, okay, just to tease you a little bit. Tease. And I'd love to talk about it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you two two things. Uh, number one, you know, I spent a lot of time with Ted Post, and he was no fan of John Milius. Yeah. So that is interesting. Now, I wrote a TV movie that Pierre David produced. And uh, when I signed my contract, they said, oh, go down the hallway because you have to get it notarized and all that stuff. So I do. I walk in and there's Adele Yoshoka. She was the head of business affairs. So you saw everyone. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Oh, she was great. She was actually in the movie we made and such a nice person. And oh, my gosh. And. She took, I never got a chance to see it, but she took Super 8 movies on the set of Magnum Force while they were filming. Who's got those? Does she have this, her estate or? Transferred them and she, you know, she and her husband, have, you know. But, you know, she is now like the executive vice president of New Image. New Image is doing their thing. Yep. So, Sonny. You know, what's it take for a girl to go to bed with you? Knock on the door. There she is, a new image. Knock on the door. 50 yep. years on, she's executive vice president. <laughs> yep. No, definitely and, Magnum yeah, Force. Just the nicest person. And she she got such a case. She really did. I mean, she, unless she was just being polite. But I was such a nerd Nick uh, around her and stuff. But she she was great. No, well, Courtney, we'll have to talk about Magnum Force later. <laughs> yes. There's so many great projects that we got to talk about in the future. Nevada Smith and all these great Blu-rays coming up. Uh, I'm just ear to ear thinking about Nevada Smith and some of these other projects coming out. As I've always said, Courtney, you need backup on a commentary. You know where to find me. I'll quote Charlie Bronson on that one. Call me if you, you know where to find me. <laughs> yep. As he, as he walked into the silhouette of the light, never to be seen in a theatrical picture again. Um, uh, there'll be no episode on Bad for Your Health next week due to Mother's Day, but tune in tomorrow for a uh, special WWE review with the wrestling guru. Got to bring the old friends back. I've realized that there's been a few 
lapses in who's been coming on and there's been a few solo show the guru returns tomorrow night for a wwe show and then we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode t topic to be determined don't forget to check out still dead illustrations and checking out all these great film commentaries by mr courtney joiner what's the next project though coming out what what's the next one is it nevada or um no i think no will penny Will Penny, that, and then uh, then I think it's um, uh, uh, Heal a Monster, Killer Shrews, and then Nevada Smith. All right, Will it. Penny will be the next project coming out on Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that can be ordered through Kino and Amazon. Check it out. I'll be waiting for Nevada Smith. Can't wait to talk to you about that. For Mr. Courtney Joyner, I am Tom. Have a good night, everyone, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>